Uh, well, first of all, let me uh, thank the organisers of the conference for the invitation to speak uh, to you this morning. Uh, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of this land here in Bali where we're meeting. Uh, and uh, I'd like to um, uh, say how pleased I was with yesterday's um, opening ceremony um, to listen to the stories, particularly the water temple story. Uh, I mean, bringing indigenous knowledge back into planning is exactly what we're on about. Uh, and I'll give you a brief insight into that this morning. Uh, and I also like to thank the organisers for that uh, brilliant uh, gesture of allowing us to release those turtles uh, yesterday afternoon. That's a memory that will remain with me the rest of my life. So thank you very much, whoever thought that up. It was brilliant. Okay. Um, what I want to talk about this morning, uh, I, want to, I don't want to give you a lesson in Planning 101, uh, but I do want to just outline some dominant theories that are influencing current planning practice to put what I'm about to present to you in context. I want to talk about planning uh, at the city and metropolitan regional scale, and I'll give reasons for that. Uh, I'll use the South East Queensland case study, and again I'll explain what South East Queensland or SEQ means uh, as I present, uh, but essentially it's in Australia. I want, then want to focus on mapping ecosystem services for planning purposes, uh, and then uh, look at a number of different themes. Planning for ecosystem services across landscape borders, and planning for ecosystem services across institutional uh, borders. And then lastly, I want to just give you my thoughts about where we go from here. So they're the three perspectives that I'm drawing upon to give you a present presentation today. So the dominant theories that are influencing current planning practice, there's two. The first one is called planning at the landscape scale, and the second is what we call values-led planning. And what do I mean by planning at the landscape scale? Well, typically people call it the landscape approach. It's a, an approach that's adopted by uh, the European Union, and Paul Salomon from Sheffield University sums it up as an area uh, as perceived by people whose character is the result of actions and interactions of natural and or human factors. So what's he saying? Well, in the past, we've either focused planning on biophysical environments or socioeconomic environments. We need to drive planning into the very heart of what's making landscape change. Landscape transformation is occurring in that socio-ecological system, the overlap. And that's where the landscape scale applies. So scale in this context is not a physical scale. It's that sort of zone of interaction between humans and the natural environment. Uh, and when you put that in context, it's not just about city planning any longer, because city folk interact with the, with the metropolitan region, the catchments. They draw on the catchments for resources. And, and the like. They get out there and they recreate. And they actually, uh, in some cases, trash it to death. They draw all their, you know, if we're talking about food mileages, they're drawing their, their, their food from that region. So the scale of planning is not city planning, it's the city region, or the metropolitan region, as we call it. So it's highly anthropocentric. It's all focused on people, this approach. I mean, unashamedly anthropocentric. But folks, the other thing is, that socio-ecological -eco uh, system, surprise, surprise, is also the zone of resilience uh, interest. So if you want to apply resili current resilience theory to planning, that's where you've got to be. It can only be there. So that's the scale I'm talking about, folks. Uh, with respect to the second theory, values-led planning, this is all about science-informing planning, or science-informing values. Evidence-based planning, in other words. And when I talk about science, I'm including what we call civic science, which is local knowledge and traditional indigenous knowledge. So we are incorporating that form of science along with the biophysical and socioeconomic science into our planning processes, and you'll see that. So with respect to values, a bit of theory on that, values are an enduring concept of worth. They're formed out of social processes of dialogue and debate, we debate these all the time, the media debates it. Uh, politicians debate values. Now, they're influenced by social, cultural, historical and geographical relationships between society and the individual. That's how we form our values. They're constructed between individuals and institutions and lastly they're informed by ethical and moral judgments by creating priorities uh, in ideas and belief systems. 
So that's how our values are, are created. And they're the values I'm talking about. Put it into an environmental context, Shadowfield says that values are defined as direct and indirect qualities of natural systems that are important to the evaluator, to you, to me, to him, to her. And that's the way the values come in. The process is to bring those values into planning and let them drive the planning process rather than some politician or bureaucrat or stakeholder group driving planning. That's not the way to do planning for planning for, for communities. So, second uh, issue that I want to discuss is planning at the city or metropolitan regional. So there's a sort of typical quarter of a million size city. We've got an urban centre defined by urban boundaries, urban services. Beyond that we have this thing called a peri-urban region and I'll discuss that in a second. Peri meaning surrounding. So that's a former rural area that's now urbanising. And beyond that, we've got the true rural region. Now, out of that urban centre, there are strong dominant urban forces seeking more land for whatever purposes. Population increases, more housing development, uh, more industry, blah, blah, blah. So those forces are pushing the city boundaries out into that peri-urban. But we also can have counter forces, strong non-urban uh, sector, that counteracts those forces. So, in other words, that peri-urban zone, that yellow zone, is a zone that's highly contested. It's a zone of conflict. And that's happening in any city in the world, whether it's developed or developing country. So the landscapes we are recognised are typical urban landscapes, typical peri-urban landscapes, and typical rural landscapes. Note the differences, population density differences. But in terms of what we're talking about today, the use of ecosystem services, the reliance on the ecosystem services changes radically in those three landscapes that I'm characterising there. So what's the relationship between landscapes, values and community goals of livability? I mean, we all seek higher qualities of life, don't we? We want to improve our standard of living. We, we, Politicians and all the planning documents that have been ever produced talk about this notion about improving livability in the region or the area or the neighbourhood. So what's, what's this all about? Well, there are those community environmental values that I just spoke about before, sitting there. But what do they do? They're expressing a desire for a higher degree of livability. Those values are all pointed in one direction, to improve livability, to maintain livability. But... Those values require the protection of landscape attributes. That's what they say. And those attributes, in terms, influence whether or not we achieve livability or not, or the high degrees of livability that we're seeking. So there's your relationship. And one can't be done without the other. It's, 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 it, they're all integrally linked. So what are these values I speak about in this so-called multifunctional regional landscape? Well, the first one is that landscape's a protective landscape. That's where biodiversity, nature conservation values are protected. It's also a working landscape. That's where you get the good quality ag land values, as an example, being protected. It's a leisure landscape. That's where it relies on nature-based recreation opportunities for all those city folk coming out there, thumping the, thumping the uh, natural environment to death by bushwalking and four-wheel driving and horse riding and bushwalking and bird watching and keep going on and on. Um, in, it's an inhabited landscape. That's where multiple set settlement values are, are expressed. It's a viewed landscape, so scenic amenity values are crucial if we want to maintain a holistic approach to this. It's an imagined landscape, cultural heritage values. It's an indigenous landscape, as I spoke about before. So indigenous values need to be identified. And it's a, it's a supporting landscape. In other words, ecosystem service values are found in that area. But I make the point again, it's a contested landscape. It's a highly contested landscape. So planning is about how do we deconflict as best we can this contestation about these values. That's what planning is, is, is all about. It's how do we satisfy these needs but also deconflict those values. So in other words, you know, conflict resolution should be part of the planning process, not after. So I'm talking about southeast Queensland. So in the, in the deep yellow is my state of Queensland, and in the green is the capital city, Brisbane, uh, and the region around it is called southeast Queensland. And there's a topographic um, uh, bird's eye view of what it, what it looks like. And you can see Brisbane by the crosshatcher in the centre there. 
uh, and note the uh, topography of the coastal uh, ranges and the escarpment to the uh, west of Brisbane. So there's the urban footprint at the moment. That pink area is what's urbanised. So we've urbanised the coast, we've urbanised all the river valleys. Now Australia, like many other Western societies, have this incredible thirst for being with water. Water is the fatal attraction, as I call it. Why do we have to be putting our homes, our cities, our towns beside water? Crazy stuff. We've gone one step further, which I won't go into today. We've invented survey techniques to increase the, the, the water frontage, to get more houses with water. We call them a canal estates. Think about that in a climate change scenario. But I won't, I'll leave it at that. But look, this, those arrows show where the urban growth is heading. Urban growth, in my neck of the woods, like many parts where you come from, is occurring in what I call the lines of least resistance. It's where the developers can get the cheapest land and it's easy to service with roads, sewage, water. It's not hillbilly country. No self-respecting developer is going to go up to the mountains unless it's rural residential. The, ma the massive urban development is occurring on our floodplains and on our uh, narrow coastal plains where it's easy to develop. So, because of that pressure of development, and I should say that in the last 10 years, a million people have moved into this, this region I'm talking about. Now, you may think from the countries you come from, a million people ain't many. But let me tell you, in Australia, <laughs> a million people is 1 20th of the population of the country. So 1 20th of Australians have packed their bongos and moved to where I live. <laughs> All right? And if that's not putting pressure on infrastructure, I don't know what is. So the state government decided back in 2004, we really need to do something about this. We, we, we need to get a handle on infrastructure expenditure. So they introduced the first statutory regional plan in the world in this neck of the woods. Statutory means it's covered by law, legislation. And then it's binding on Every government department is binding on local government, the lower levels of government, and it's binding on, on, on private enterprise by law. It can only be changed by an act of parliament. So the plan I've got there is the second iteration, the 2009 version, which is the one I'll be speaking about today. But it became statutory post-2004. I won't bore you with this. I, I just want you to quickly cast your eyes over what's in yellow. All right, this, this is the regional vision statement Getting livability, make, how do we achieve livability for South East Queensland? That's the words. Ecosystem services is not mentioned. But if you look at the words there, there's all those elements, the functions embedded in those words there. So again, I, I won't read through that, but you can quickly cast your eyes through that and you can see the, the bottom two, ecological, cultural, significant landscapes are valued, celebrated, protected and enhanced. Well, that's a pretty strong statement. Okay, government, put your money where your mouth is. <laughs> that's essentially what that says, or what I take from that. The community has access to a range of quality, open space, recreation opportunities. Again, you know, it, it's in this area that we're talking about with ecosystem services. So let's see now how this plan deals with, uh, has attempted to deal with ecosystem services. The structure of the plan, there's uh, 12 DROs, desirable regional outcomes. Those desirable regional outcomes, folks, are value statements. So this plan has values embedded into it. And what's driving all the policies and all the programs out of this plan are these values. So every DRO is a value statement. And it comes from extensive community consultation. It's not a group of bureaucrats or planners or politicians sitting in a back room working these statements out. It comes from extensive community consultation. And ecosystem services are referenced in four of those DROs, two, three, four, and uh, 11. So let's have a closer look at that, particularly DRO four, natural resources. I'll quickly give you a couple of uh, key statements where ecosystem services are referenced. First of all, in Part C, which is the overarching description of the planning approach dealing with regional land, uh, land use patterns, it says the regional landscape and rural production areas, natural assets require management uh, to improve the capacity to provide ecosystem services, there it is in black and white, 
uh, increase the region's resilience, so it's linked to resilience, uh, and support the population. So again, the supporting function uh, or role is noted. So again, you're starting to see some strong uptake of the concepts of ecosystem services in the planning approach. Whether or not it delivers in terms of program is another issue, and we'll get to that. But at least the statements are there, the right words are there. Uh, under DRO2, uh, natural environment, again, without reading the detail, you can see the ecosystem services is specifically referenced, is acknowledged. Um, with the regional landscape values, there's, there it is there. It talks about the Southeast Queensland Ecosystem Services Framework. And those of you, that, as I understand it, this is my first uh, uh, Ecosystem Services Conference, but as I understand it, Simone Maynard presented that at uh, last year's conference. Uh, the work that she's been doing with SEQ catchments, uh, developing that framework which has been brought into this plan. And then there's this other statement here about what that SEQ Ecosystem uh, Services Framework entails. Right, so th th they're, they're strong sort of supporting statements, recognition of the value of that ecosystem services framework in this statutory regional planning, legal binding planning. Then we come to DRO4 with natural resources where you get the main policy. So here again the document refers to ecosystem services clearly as benefits people obtain from ecosystems. Pretty straightforward. But the important thing here is there's 28 functions, uh, sorry, 28 ecosystem services that are referenced in that document under DRO4. And there they are there and you'll recognise uh, all of those. There, with some modification, of course, from, from the literature. But that's what the SEQ Ecosystem Services Framework has identified, those 28 ecosystem services, and that's now embedded into the plan. So there's an intent to recognise, there's an intent to protect. Okay, so... The plan's pretty simple. That's the map. It's not a complicated map. There's only three areas. One is the urban footprint, and that's got an urban growth boundary, and it says developers, you can't develop any land outside that pink area. All future urban development has to be in that pink area. So it accounts for the existing population plus another million people, because we expect another 20th of Australians to come to our neck of the woods. It's it's what I call God's country. It's got the best beaches, best, best rainforest. It's uh, just a great uh, environment. So everyone has recognised that. It's what happened in California in the 60s. Everyone came from the uh, east coast to the west coast. Well, they're all coming to southeast Queensland. So that regulates where development can occur in that pink area. Those orange areas are rural living. That's the rural res. That's the peri-urban landscape. And the government said, no more, enough is enough. It's waste land having people live on two and a half acres, you know, grazing a few horses, non-productive, former agricultural land. So that's been stopped. And the rest is called the green, the regional landscape and rural production area. So we've got this continuum of regional landscapes, increasing um, human landscapes and uh, increasing natural landscapes in that direction. So there's some photographs that give you a range of landscapes uh, in this um, regional landscape rural production area. So the elements of the um, landscape framework, the regional landscape framework, there are those eight value um, functions that I mentioned before, ecosystem services being number eight. There's the thing called, we call landscape corridors as part of the plan, interurban breaks and interregional landscape links. Now what do I mean by that? Well, let's take this theoretical diagram. The yellow represents the regional landscape rural production area and it goes offshore because we plan three nautical miles offshore as well. So it includes coast and um, uh, nearby ocean uh, islands and bays. We've got urban footprints laid down with urban growth boundaries. No development outside that pink area. They're separated by interurban breaks. So we're trying to prevent the urban areas from joining. We don't want a megalopolis. We don't want the... We don't want the sort of the Bostons, um, um, New York, uh, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Washington sort of conglomeration. We don't want the Londons uh, of this world. So we're trying to break it up by legislation. Then we've got these uh, inter-regional inter uh, links that link it all to other regions. Then we've got all these values that I spoke about before that come out of that um, regional landscape area. 
and where we recognise that they're prominent, uh, we're calling those landscape character areas, and where there's a predominance of those, they're called core landscape areas. So this core landscape area concept is important to what I'm talking about today. And then all that's linked up, so the whole system has these landscape corridors linking it up every which way. So that's the theoretical construct of what we're trying to do in planning terms. So the core landscape areas are defined as areas of the highest confluence of multiple regional landscape values and ecosystem services. So I'll just put that map up there in that diagram because I want, I want you to watch these spaces because I'm going to take you now through some maps very quickly of the values. So just watch those spaces. Okay? Those four spaces as I go now. So nature conservation values, the biodiversity values, darkest green, highest biodiversity values, state significant. Note, note where they are. Rural production, good quality ag land. Forestry, light green. Best forestry land. The, the lighter shades of yellow and buff are the river valleys, high agricultural uh, soils. Nature-based recreation. Dark green is category seven or six, more six. Nature-based recreation. Category seven is wilderness experiences. Right, so that's on the recreation opportunity spectrum, one to seven. Seven being the most related to the natural environment. So that's, gr that's the, the two greens. Where are the settlements? Well, here's a satellite imagery with the um, glow at night. So you can see where those settlements are in the region. Scenic amenity values. Yes, we have mapped scenic amenity through consultation. So again, the um, regional significant scenic amenity areas are the dark blue, followed by the pink. Landscape heritage is the best we've got at this stage. This is not uh, final, but this is European heritage. So this is you know, post-European contact. Uh, we've also mapped indigenous landscape values, but we haven't got them all because we're still get doing that process and indigenous people in, uh, in South East Queensland, you know, well, all over Australia, reserve the right as to what knowledge they want in the planning process. So, but there's an example. So that's finding its way in there. And I should say, this is giving voice to indigenous people in the planning process, which has never happened before in, uh, in Australia. So ecosystem service functions. Here's the map um, from SEQ uh, catchments. And again, uh, where you get the confluence of the highest uh, functions, uh, it's the dark green. Landscape corridors into urban breaks, they've all been mapped. So let me now just talk about mapping uh, ecosystem services for planning purposes. This is the framework that the SEQ uh, ecosystems framework is based upon, and that should be of no surprise to anyone. Uh, from their work, the area that I want to talk about largely is ecosystem functions, which is um, in the centre there, and it's these functions here. So you can see there's mostly um, um, regulating, but there's also a couple of uh, provisioning, uh, one service and one um, cultural. So the 19 ecosystem service functions uh, in South East Queensland that have been mapped are those 19. And that gives that confluence there, again, of the dark green. But now watch what I do now. I overlay the local authority boundaries. So the organisation in Australia that is responsible for giving approval to land development, to private development, is the local councils. Not the state government and certainly not the federal government. Our national government has no res constitutional responsibility in uh, planning. It's state and local. And states have given, delegated that to local. So there's 10 local governments I've just overlaid over that map. Look where their boundaries are. So, one council goes one way, another one goes another way. So, let's talk about planning across landscape borders first. Here are the core landscape areas. So, this dark green represents the highest confluence of all those eight values I spoke about before, including ecosystem services values now. That's the, that's the jewel in the crown in South East Queensland. But again, I put the overlay 
of the planning authorities over that. What we've done is we've come up with an open space system at this stage. That's that map and it largely uses the riparian zones where it's not freehold. I should say that 83% of the region I'm talking about is freehold. What that means is that private individuals or companies can own that land. It's not owned by the government. And that's another factor. Land tenure, land ownership is crucial to the way in which these planning and these plans are done. So, what have we got here? We've got a regional open space network which largely is based on the remnant vegetation of our ridgelines and mountaintops and what is left of the riparian zone in our river and creek valleys. And what's coming out of that? Well, out of that area is coming all those eight values that I spoke about before, that highly contested values. But there's also demands on that. There's an urban demand, a rural demand, a peri-urban demand, an environmental demand, and a cultural demand. So again, this is where planning across these landscapes represented by those values and those demands need to come together. So all the threats and opportunities you can see on this map here. There's one area of threat, the other, and I've also introduced the peri-urban, the major peri-urban area in South East Queensland, not as so much a threat but as an opportunity. So we've got threats and opportunities that we need to deal with in planning that come from this analysis of all these values. And I think the GIS maps I've just shown you gives you a clue as to how that's built up. So planning across institutional borders, well there are those uh, ecosystem service functions I mentioned previously. But folks, the question I ask, and it hasn't been developed at this stage, is what are the managerial connections between those functions? Because different agencies of government and different levels of government are responsible for managing those functions. So how do we bring that together in a region or in a city? So this is a typical planning hierarchy. It applies in your country as well as mine. There's national interest, and as I said before, ours are pretty weak in Australia because of our constitution. There's state interest or provincial interest. So coming down the levels of government, and the yellow is local government, which is where most of the planning decisions are made. And then in the green, you have a whole raft of other planning going on by different government agencies, private sector or what have you. And then what we've done is introduce that red concept of a regional plan, a strategic plan, to deal with regional interest. And we believe ecosystem services are best handled at that scale, the, 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 the red. But overlay that, that's the landscape we're dealing with that I've just been speaking about. So you can see it picks up on just about all the interest, including national interest, because it comes through another piece of legislation which is binding on the Commonwealth from uh, international obligations. Uh, I haven't got time to go into this, but again, we've done a roadmap of how you link up between regional scale planning and local scale planning, and how you deal with the massive public expenditure on infrastructure that's changing or transforming the landscape. So this public infrastructure for roads or airports or ports, I mean, we've got a massive debate going on in Australia at the moment about more coal ports and its impact on the Great Barrier Reef, World Heritage. Right, so you need to connect in order to get all the policies aligned. Because otherwise, one level of government's going this way, another level of government's going that way, and the community's going that way. So this is a road map, but what I want to show you here is where those asterisks are that I've just put up there is points of negotiation or renegotiation. That's the missing ingredient in the planning process. Negotiation and renegotiation, because planning is not just mapping and sitting out at, you know, at a table or getting out in the field. It's, it's the hard yards about planning is negotiating and renegotiating policy program outcomes, value-led outcomes. That's what it's about. So here's our protected areas in South East Queensland at the moment. This is current national parks or current reserves or what have you. The point I want to make here 
with respect to ecosystem services is there's no one level of government or no department responsible for ecosystem services. There's no department of ecosystem services like we have a department of main roads or a department of water supply or a department of planning and urban development. There's no department of ecosystem services. So who in government is responsible for ecosystem services? That's the question and that's the challenge. So where to from here? I'm not going to leave you hanging there. <laughs> I wouldn't do that to you. Okay, so the idea that we're coming up with and that, we, that we're moving towards is this idea about plan alignment. So the plan on the right, the, the green, is the South East Queensland Natural Resource Management Plan, which is where the majority of the work for the SEQ ecosystems framework has been developed. And we're trying to align it to the statutory regional plan on your left. And what we've come up with at the moment is what I call a holding hands model. The two plans just hold hands. They're in love. And that's about as far as it goes at this stage. The question I want to pose is, well, how do we take it to the next level? The next level is what I call the piggyback approach, where you piggyback the provisions of the non-statutory NRM plan in the statutory land use plan. I mean, there's a third model too, which I'm not going to go into, and that's called the consumer model, where the red plan eats the green plan. And that's the highest order of integration. But I think in the world of political reality, the best we can achieve at this stage is perhaps the piggyback model, where you take the values and the targets that the plan in the green document is trying to achieve and you repeat the same values and the same targets in the red plan, in the statutory plan. So that's, that's where we're, we're at, at the moment. There's also a need to move towards a holistic ecosystem service model for planning and management. I'm telling some of you how to suck eggs, but I'll go through it. So we, we, we know the ecosystem uh, functions in South East Queensland. But we really got to get a better handle on who owns those, but more importantly, who manages those. We also need to look at the other side of the equation. Who's the recipient of these ecosystem services in South East Queensland, and who is purchasing, or who wants to purchase them? We're just starting that economy right now, the purchase of ecosystem services, albeit very small. And that's got to be cast in terms of, not as a separate box to the right, but embraced in that is this community well-being, this, this vision, these other values. But, but, that all happens under a legislative set of arrangements. It all happens under a governance arrangements. And it all happens under institutional arrangements. Can't divorce it. Can't divorce it. If you want to make ecosystem services count, you've got to link it back. And you've got to link it back to, in our case, in your case, the land tenure system the land use zoning system and the land ownership system, all three different. So if you really want to get into protecting ecosystem services, you've got to have an intimate knowledge of what's overarching it all. And in the context of uh, the other side, you've got to look at communities that are beneficiaries, you've got to look at the markets that come out of those communities, and you've got to look at things like traders, institutions, and organisations that are set up that are relevant to ecosystem services, um, well, whatever it is, protection or enhancement or whatever. So the last thing I want to deal with now is what are the characteristics of a future resilient and sustainable metropolitan region? And how should we plan for it now? Because we're talking about the future, you start planning now. I mean, think about climate change. 20, 30, 50, 100 years in the future. It's no good waiting <laughs> for the sea level to rise. Plan for it now. Um, we're just starting a massive four-year research program under this new uh, thing we call in Australia a cooperative research centre for water-sensitive cities. And I want to show you this to show you how we're going to build in ecosystem services considerations into this planning agenda, uh, this research agenda that we're undertaking for the next four years. Um, this is um, the program I'm responsible for. It's called Water-Sensitive Urbanism. Uh, it'll focus on the influence 
of urban configurations and resource flows across a range of scales. Uh, it will apply green infrastructure, climate responsive design principles to water security, flood protection and ecological health of terrestrial and uh, aquatic uh, landscapes from street to whole of catchment level, although mostly it will be at the whole of catchment level scale. It will establish um, the uh, integrative uh, socio-technological uh, urban planning and design processes that will deliver the practical tools required to improve resilience uh, of Australian urban environments. And the key issues that we're focusing on are ecological values, ecosystem services, design, planning and ecological landscapes. So we're bringing that science-informing policy, science-informing values um, paradigm together here. So it's our intention to combine state-of-the-art science of climate change modelling, uh, streamwater ecology and chemistry, and urban climatology uh, with the best thinking on urban planning, design and practice that we can uh, lay our hands on. So the way it's going to work is like this. We'll look at a, wood, a, water, a total water system in a metropolitan regional uh, uh, scale that I spoke about before, groundwater, uh, uh, surface water, recycled water, stored water, dimensions of input, precipitation, output, vap evapotranspiration. We'll look at water quality and water quantity. And we'll do that through the lenses of a flooding ecosystem services framework and an open space system framework. And that'll all occur in context of the present, so you're dealing with a current population. And what we'll do is we'll develop an adaptive mass water balance and urban metabolism model to deal with this. So we're going to look at water flows, energy flows through that, through that system under an urban metabolism model, but upping it to the metropolitan scale if we can do it. And we'll look at that in the context of future population growth. So that's where we get into climate change scenarios and start looking at those as well. Because to deal with the future, we must plan now. All right, so that, that's the conceptual model that we've just developed to take our research forward for the next four years in the Cooperative Research Centre for Water Sensitive Cities. My take home messages for, for you, if you'll accept them. Um, the first take home message is that ecosystem service framework needs to, u needs to be used in association with other frameworks in a mutually supportive approach. It is my belief that ecosystem service framework by itself will not deliver the goods in the statutory planning that we're talking about. But with and in combination with other frameworks, they're mutually supportive. They go hand in hand. Ecosystem services need to be protected and enhanced through statutory planning processes at multiple scales. If it's not statutory, forget it. You're wasting your time. No one's, going to, no one's going to be held accountable. The identification of ecosystem services requires qualitative and quantitative approaches supported by robust biophysical, socioeconomic and civic science. But I emphasise it's now time to look at the quantitation of those values. And the identification of ecosystem services should lead to protection and rehabilitation policies and programs. We're not just out there trying to protect the jewel in the crown. We're out there trying to rehabilitate to put more back into the system. I mean, we're dealing with a highly fragmented landscape in most cases. So we've got to put the jigsaw back together as best we can under the constraints that we're dealing with. And the biggest constraint in South East Queensland is that 83% of free our land. You know, the ind farmers, individuals, private development companies own. There's potential, I would argue potentially the greatest challenge that we've got in the protection and rehabilitation of ecosystem services is in that dynamic peri-urban zone. That peri-urban zone, particularly in my neck of the woods, changes week by week. <laughs> There's new developments going on all the time. And lastly, I'm arguing for a joined up planning process, as I call it. So people call it integrated. I don't like using that word. Um, but it's, it's joined up, holding, more than holding hands, of course. Um, planning and management approach, uh, you, you'll need that to adequately address protection and rehabilitation of ecosystem services across landscapes and institutional borders. And that's the best part of South East Queensland. Thank you very much.